Welcome, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm your host, Peter Joseph, for another DxO webinar. Welcome to my little show. Today, we are going to be exploring Analog Effects Pro, specifically in regards to landscape photos. Let me bring up the agenda. Our normal agenda slide appears to be missing today. So we're just looking at the registration page. But what you are attending today is adding vintage effects to landscape images with Analog Effects by DxO. We're going to be starting off with Photolab, doing a little bit of basic setup work for each photo before sending it off to um, after analog effects. Vintage effects to landscape images, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to start out with the basic filters. We're going to look at just some of the presets that are in there. And pretty quickly, we're going to get into modifying those and making our own because, of course, that's where the real fun is. But let's start with something really, really simple. I'm going to go back to Photolab here. We're going to start with this photo, which is already you know, it's kind of a nice picture. It's this beautiful, beautiful sunset up on a lake in uh, Southern Oregon. And this is one of those photos where you look at and you think, oh, I don't really need to do anything to it. I mean, this is straight out of camera as a raw file. So of course it has the raw processing that has been done by Photolab already, but this is essentially straight out of camera. And uh, there's not really anything that it needs, but sometimes doing these effects isn't a, about what it needs. It's just about what you want to do, trying to have some fun with the images. Sometimes you can be really surprised. Um, I find that I'm often surprised by some of the effects that you can do that will give you unexpected results that you're just going, oh, well, I never even would have thought of that. And this is, uh, this is a cool new approach to this photo. And that's one of the fun things about Analog Effects Pro specifically, because it is such a wildly creative filter with so many different options that will really do dramatically different things to your images. I think it's a lot of fun to play with just to experiment and see what's going to happen next. And, you know, there are certainly effects that you'll apply and you go, ooh, no, that that just that does not work at all. But then there's others that you'll apply and go, wow, I never even would have thought of that. And I, I like the look of that. So um, with that said, we're going to take this one in there and see what we can do. I'm going to go ahead and hide my camera for now just to make a little bit more room on the screen for everything else. And I will uh, bring that back when we do the Q&A. All right, so there is one thing I do need to fix on here, and that is the horizon line. Apparently, I was falling over when I took this picture. So in Photolab, you have this great horizon tool. Click on it here, and it brings up this line, which I can now position wherever the horizon should be. So all I need to do is line up one edge of that. So there's one edge on that horizon line. Take the other one and line that up. And you, know, you can get as close and careful as you want in there. I think that looks pretty good. We uh, click on apply, and we'll see what that looks like. And it has rotated the image and it has cropped it. You can see the crop guides up at the top because of course, if you just rotate it without cropping it, you'll end up with some black stuff around the edges. So that has cropped it in as minimal as necessary. It is worth pointing out that you can of course recrop it if you want to at this point, if I wanted to kind of just change how it had cropped it, uh, crop things a little bit differently, I can, but I'm just gonna leave it. I think it's, I think it's fine the way it is. So that's all that I wanna do in Photo Labs. Now it's time to take it into the Nick collection. Click on the Nick collection button. I will remind you down here at the bottom, you have your settings where you can choose whether you're going to export as a JPEG, a TIFF, or export the selected files without processing. I bring this up just because I ran into this helping somebody out the other day when they had left it in here in the export selected files without processing, and then trying to open this photo into, photo, uh, into one of the plugins won't work because this is a raw file and the file does have to be processed. So if you're running into that, just make sure that you set this back to export as TIFF. And honestly, I can't even imagine why you'd ever export as a JPEG. So, you know, don't. But exporting as a TIFF gives you the most data. You got that full 16 bit color in there. And that is where you're going to want that thing. And then we'll just send this off to Analog Effects Pro 2. So, we'll give the software a moment to render this out. And what we're going to start with is just playing, just clicking on a bunch of presets to see what we can get in here. The presets that we'll find to start are listed here on the left under this collection called Classic Camera. If I click up here in the top left, if for those who haven't seen this before, you'll find a variety of what are called tool combinations. And they're just they're just a variety of different presets. These are all the tools that we have here in this list. These collections here are a variety of combinations of these tools that are put into things that someone has determined look like a black and white camera, like a wet plate camera, like a vintage camera, a multi-lens camera, and so on. And so you can just click through these randomly and play with the different looks. And we'll just start with classic camera because this is where you're going to find what I'd call the most kind of normal looks that you're going to apply. And as we apply each one of these presets over on the right-hand side, you'll see all the adjustments that have been added to it. And not every adjustment necessarily gets added. All right, let me, let me open this back up again. 
and you'll see here under tools, you've got basic adjustment, lens distortion, bokeh, zoom and rotate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yet over here on the right, we're only seeing basic adjustments, dirt and scratches, lens vignette, and film type being applied to this particular preset. As we get into other presets, then this selection here will change, but at any time you can go in and add any of these other effects to it. And we'll get into that later on, but just know going into this that you can start with any preset and then add anything else to it that you like. But let's just continue playing with the presets that are in here. So this classic camera, to me, this looks like a, an old Kodak film type of a film stock. It's very, very warm. There's not a whole lot of bright blues in there. It really is tilting towards the oranges and the reds. And this is a beautiful image. If we do a compare, hold that down, we can see the original underneath it. So that was a beautiful image. Ah, that's a beautiful image. You know, what do you like? But then we go to this one and look at how different this is. Now, okay, there's all this weird dirt that's showing up on there. That's because the dirt and scratches filter has been added. I tend to not use that very often. I'm gonna turn that off. I don't like dirty pictures. I like my pictures clean. So I'm gonna turn off that dirt and scratches. And now I have this really beautiful film look that is very different from classic camera two that we started with. It has a totally different color profile. And again, it's one of those where you go, wow, I, I wouldn't have thought maybe to process my photo that way. Then we move to this one, classic camera four. And yet again, massively different, totally different color profile bit less saturated, almost a, almost a bleach bypass kind of look, but not quite, really quite interesting. Just the differences between these is really, really dramatic. And I do this just to really drive that point home that going through here and playing, that's kind of cool, playing with these different presets is a great way to explore and to get ideas of what your image might become, what you might want to do with it. And uh, yeah, it's really fun. So let's just, I'm just going to pop through a few more of these just to again, give you some ideas of what's in here. Then we'll jump into some of the other presets. Let's go for, let's try color cast. I'm just gonna click through a few. For those who have, may have not seen this tool before, just so you get some ideas of the options. Again, starting from this very, a very golden um, sunset photo with the blue sky in the background and just seeing how dramatically different these different presets are. It's really quite fun. You get these motion presets in here to add some weird motion stuff, which, you know, doesn't always work, right? There are images that, this just doesn't make sense for this photo. But if you want to get into this, you know, there's all kinds of fun things you can do in here, um, but it doesn't apply to every photo. And I think that's worth pointing out as well. These different effects don't necessarily apply to every photo, like wet plate. Okay, wet plate photography is something that you could certainly do taking a picture of anything anywhere. So sure, that might totally work for this style of photo, but if that's not what you're looking for, then it's probably not a good place to start. Uh, let's do subtle, well, subtle bokeh. That really isn't going to make sense for this. That's more like a portrait type of a photo. Double exposure, that could be kind of cool. You know, let's see what's in here. We're getting these looks of having uh, double exposure where, meaning where the camera was triggered twice on the same piece of film. Maybe one of the times the camera was moving, the other time it was static. That's kind of what we're seeing in here. Some strange, strange effects of having a, the same photo taken twice on a uh, on a single sheet of film, just really getting into some strange dramatic stuff. And then there's this multi-lens, which is more like, a, uh, what do you call this? A triptych, diptych, quadtych, whatever that would be called, kind of a layout. And each one being a little bit different. Again, just a fun way to play with different layouts in here. So lots of different options in here. There's this En Vogue, which is one of the more new, more recent selection of presets. Some that are a bit more, okay, maybe not common and standard, but but a bit more, a bit less unusual. Let's let's call it that. A little bit less unusual in some of these. Some of these presets are pretty wacky, and you might never ever want to use them. Whereas here, this En Vogue, I think, does have a nice collection of presets that are a bit more usable. And remember, each one of these is meant to be a starting point. Obviously, you can just click a preset and hit I go, and just be done with it, and that's perfectly fine too. Um, or you can modify it. So if I go back again to where was it? The classic camera is that the one I like? Yeah, that one. And I get rid of that dirt and scratches. That to me is a pretty cool effect. And you know, for my money, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm happy with that. So I'm gonna click on save. Actually, before I do, just to remind you as well, you do have this option here, save and edit later, which will allow me to come back and re-edit this file. So if I had done a bunch of really complex work to this and I thought, you know, I might wanna come back later and change something, then I would do that. But since in this case, all I did was choose a preset and turn off the dirt and scratches, there's really no benefit to saving that. I can redo that easily enough later. So I'll leave it off, click save, and we'll get this nice, beautiful TIFF file of the uh, of the photo that I've just altered. So there's that, let's load that up, and there she is. So that's a start to that, something nice and simple. Now, 
let's take a different approach. I'm going to go to this photo next. This is shot in Connecticut in the fall, and you can kind of see the fall colors. It's this country road. Um, the cool thing about a photo like this is timing could be anything, could be anywhere. When was this taken? Was this taken you know, this year? Was it taken 20 years ago? Was it taken 50 years ago? It's kind of timeless. The type of road might be a little bit of a giveaway, but other than that, it's a pretty timeless photo. So let's say that you want to do some kind of vintage -y effect to this. Part of the approach, I think, is figuring out how you want it to look, if you want something specific, and what the color palette, what the film types will even look like for that. I'm gonna turn the camera on for just a moment here, and address you guys directly. When you're, when you're taking an approach of looking at a, uh, a photo that you're going to apply a specific type of effect, and you have in your mind, okay, I wanna do like a 1970s vintage, vintage 1970s photo, um, what does that actually look like? Well, in this case, Google can be your friend. I'm not going to fire up Google and do a search because that is just definitely a recipe for disaster in a live event. But I encourage you to do this and do searches for things like landscape, fall, 1970s film, and then click on the photos tab. Do keywords like that and see what kind of color palettes come up. See what, what photos look like from that. Look for some old scans and study those and get some ideas. Of, okay, so that's what it looked like. The image wasn't as sharp as what we see today. The colors were a bit more muted. Maybe they were a very warm toned or very cool toned or kind of follow that idea and then drive that idea into your own photo. So instead of just relying on presets and just relying on the randomness of the filter, try going a specific direction and thinking, well, yeah, I want this to look like that type of film or that type of image shot in that era. Look at reference images. Again, Google is your friend there and see what you can come up with and then try to apply that kind of look to your own photos. That's kind of a kind of a cool thing to do. So with that in mind, I'm going to uh, start by just doing a little base exposure check. Let's just see where we're at with this photo. It's everything's within range. I'm not clipping any highlights or shadows. If I look at my histogram here, we can see that we're not all the way to black here and we do have some highlight area, but that's probably this part of the trees up here. So if I wanted to, I could stretch this out a little bit, add a little bit more contrast. So I'm going to do that by going to the curves. Regular viewers know that I'm a fan of using curves and I will just pull the shadows down a touch. Just wanna add a little bit of contrast here and I'm watching my histogram. Always watching my histogram up here, making sure I don't go too far. Let's see if I go too far just to show what happens. If I go too far there, we can see that I've clipped the edge here. I definitely have some, uh, some lost detail slammed up against the black wall here, so I don't wanna do that. So I just wanna add a little bit of contrast while watching the histogram. Remember, you can't trust your screen. Even if you're working on a really, really high-end display, you don't wanna trust it explicitly. You do want to look at your histogram because what you see here is the truth. This is the truth. This is telling you what the image actually is. The rest of this is just an interpretation. So there's my shadow set. I'll bring up the brights just a little bit. Don't wanna go too far. Don't wanna get crazy bright in there. And uh, we'll, we'll just kind of stretch that out. Someone asked me the other day, whether the um, whether the histogram should always go from black to white or you know all the way down to this end, all the way up to this end? The simple answer is no. It really depends on the image. Like this image here, let's forget about the sky for a moment. In fact, let me crop this out. Let me, let's really forget about the sky by getting rid of it entirely. Uh, let's see, I'm going to unconstrain that crop and just pull it down here. All I want to do is get rid of the sky, okay? So by getting rid of the sky, now, when we look at the histogram, we'll see that bright spot in here is gone. So looking at this photo now, should this histogram go all the way to the edge? Well, let's see what happens if I do. I'm going to raise up the highlights here until that histogram starts to get towards the edge. And is that now correct? Well, no, this is not that bright. The grass here should not be that bright. This high area of the histogram really should be reserved for really bright spots of the image, and there's no reason for the grass to be that bright. So no, the answer is no, there's no reason to stretch an image out all the way like that. It just depends on what's in the photo. In this particular image, because I have this very dark tree, the dark bark on the tree, some dark shadows up here, some dark spots under the bridge, here it makes sense that my darkest areas do get close to pure black, that they should approach that. But if that wasn't in there, then again, the same thing would apply. Your dark sh probably shouldn't go that far down. So just one of those things to think about. How you adjust your image is not based off of the histogram. You need to look at the histogram to make sure that what you're doing is not over or underexposing something. 
but just because you have range here doesn't necessarily mean you need to fill it. All right, with all that blabber out of the way, let me, let's see, I'm gonna reset my crop. Um, let's go back to the crop tool and we'll just bring this back up because I don't actually want to crop that out. And my curves are set the way I want them. Um, I'm gonna zoom into 100% and point something else out about this image. I want to take this photo into the Analog FX Pro, of course, and I wanna make this look kind of like film. And one of the things about film is it's nowhere near as sharp as digital is. Digital is just insanely sharp. Film is not that sharp. And if I look at this photo, I feel like it's over sharpened. I'm looking at it at 100%. And I don't know how much of this is translating through to what you guys can see on the other end of the webinar screen, but this to me feels over sharpened. And that might be fine. In fact, it would be fine if I was printing this as it is, but I wanna get rid of some of that sharpness. So I'm gonna actually take some of that out here in Photolab before I send this off to the plugin. So if I look at my corrections that are done in here, there is a lens sharpness correction and I'm just gonna turn it off and see what happens. And that on its own right there, it does take out some of that sharpness. I would say this is now under sharp for most use, but because I know I'm sending this off to a plugin to make it look like film, I don't want that over sharpness. So I'm just gonna leave that off. So just a, a little lesson in there, if you want this thing to look like film, you're gonna have to soften it. It's too sharp coming out of cameras. Modern cameras is just too sharp. So add a little bit of softness in there and it'll be a bit more believable. All right, with that said, now I've got my image set up and ready to go. Click the Nick Collection button into Analog Effects Pro and away we go. Also I wanna point out too that I am working on a Mac today. So there may be keyboard shortcuts or some differences in what you see if you're on Windows. Uh, all, I'm not, I can't tell you every single difference because I don't use a PC, but there are a little bit of subtle differences in the program. And of course, if I use a keyboard shortcut, then that will be changed slightly as well. Um, all right, so with that said, we are now back into the plugin and, um, and let's see what we should do. Let's, let's kind of run through some of these classic camera presets again and see what looks good in here. I mean, that's kind of a cool look. It actually looks kind of vintagey, filmy. But again, I want to go for that 1970s-ish film look. So. So far, none of these are saying that to me. None of these are anywhere near there. I'm gonna keep going through these, trying different ones. And I'm clicking on them to load them full screen, but obviously we can see on the left here, a very nice, large thumbnail preview of what those might look like. And we get to a point where we go, uh-huh. All right, and well, now we're getting somewhere. This has that look, kind of, you know, maybe not completely there, but it has that look of, of that kind of classic film look from the 70s. All right, cool, so we're getting somewhere. Now, what else do I wanna to do to it though? It's a little undersaturated, I feel like. I do wanna bring up some saturation. So let's go into the basic adjustments that are already in here. And we can see it's actually desaturated. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just start by undoing that. Let's set that back to zero and see where that looks. Um, it's actually pretty good. I might wanna, wanna add a little bit more to it. Oh, sure, why not? Let's, let's give it a little extra saturation in there. All right, that's looking pretty good. I kinda of like that. Um, that's, yeah, that's looking pretty good. Let's, let's go to 100% on here. Let's zoom in close and see how this is looking up close. And remember the whole discussion about sharpness? This is nice. It doesn't have that over sharpness to it, but maybe I want to give it an even softer look. I just, maybe I'm feeling like it's still just a little bit too crispy. So I want to give it a little bit of a, a softness to it, a little bit of a lens softness. Well, I'm not going to find that under basic adjustments or the dirt and scratches or lens vignetting or film type. I'm going to find that under the lens distortion tool. Now, if I right now just click on this, in fact, I'm gonna do this just to kind of, it's gonna mess up what I've done. But if I click on this now, it's going to replace what I just had over here. So what I've done is I've just removed all of the effects and I've added this lens distortion, which is you know a big oopsies, that's not what I wanted. Command Z or Control Z will undo that at this point. So I can undo and go back to where I was. In this case, what I wanted to do is actually add one of these adjustments, not just replace it. So to do that, you have to enter the camera kit mode. And I, by adding this, it already put it in there. So let me just back up. Let's just say we're starting over again. I'm back here at, uh, which one was it? I think it was classic camera eight. Yeah, it was classic camera eight. This is where I started. And then I had played with the saturation a little bit. And at this point, I wanna add one of those extra adjustments. Again, if I click here, it's just going to add it. So what you need to do is go into the build a camera mode, go into the camera kit. When I click on this, nothing changes on the right. None of my existing filters adjustments have been altered, but now on the left, I have a list of different adjustments that I can work with. And if I wanna add something to it, you'll see the ones that are added are bold and the ones that are not are dimmed out. 
And you'll see that as I roll over it, there's a little plus that pops up. And if I click on that plus, so in this case, lens distortion, I click on that, it adds it into the stack. And what's interesting about Analog Effects Pro versus Color Effects Pro is the order of these is fixed. The order that these adjustments get added in is always the same. You can't move these around and change the position like you can with Color Effects Pro. So it's just a different approach to the edit. This is kind of a, a by design, this hands off to this, hands off to this, hands off to this, and so on. All right, so I've just added this lens distortion. So there's a few things happening in here. There's already a bit of pin cushion slash barrel distortion added. There's a chromatic shift that is happening. And then there's defocusing that's not happening. So just to understand what these are, let me take chromatic shift and crank it all the way up. And in fact, I'm also going to just temporarily turn off all of these other effects so we can see only what's happening here. So look at the edges. The chromatic shift means that our colors are being separated. It's almost like a like looking at a 3D photo without the 3D glasses, you know, the kind of old, old school 3D photos. And if I take this down, that brings it back into place. Now, normally you would not want chromatic shift. And in fact, chromatic aberration is something that is corrected inside of the, inside of PhotoLab when you first open up an image. However, uh, if you want to add it to make it look like a vintage image, then you can do that. You can add that back in and you can even change the color shift. Is it a uh, kind of a red cyan, is it a purple magenta, I'm um, uh, green magenta, is it a yellow blue shift? You can choose how that shift is going to look. Let me bring that up all the way and cycle through those colors again. So you can kind of see the differences in there. I This is not what I want. So I don't want any of this. If I reset it, it actually goes back to this 30% added. I don't want any of this. So I'm going to drag that down to 0%. And then the pin cushion, I don't want this to be distorted either. That's not why I'm in this filter. So if I look at what it does, there's full barrel distortion. There's full pin cushion distortion, but I don't want either of them. So I'm going to set this back to its center point. There are no numbers on here. And so this one's a little bit hard to get exactly neutral, but just kind of right around the middle there is gonna be fine. And if you really wanna check it against the original, you can always just toggle this on and off. So let's say that I thought that was accurate and I toggle this on and off. I go, oh, nope, nope, it's not quite there. Okay, let's get this back down to the default position. We'll say right about there toggle that on and off and I see no changes happening. So, so I think we're good to go. What I do want in here though, is the defocus. So I just removed the pin cushioning. I removed the chromatic shift. Now I wanna take advantage of defocusing. So let's zoom into hundred percent here and just, I'll take the defocus all the way up. Let's just take it all the way up to start. And you can see, well, it's clearly out of focus. It's clearly blurry now. And it's more than just a blur. It's a special algorithm that does something that's meant to look like an out of focus camera, not just a Gaussian blurred camera. So there's a little bit of, of secret sauce that's happening in there, but uh, I just want a little bit of it. I don't want a huge amount. So I'm just going to go from the zero point. Let's just take it up just a little bit, add just a little bit of softness in there. And we can compare as well by pressing and holding the compare button and probably get a little bit more than that. Let's get a little bit more again, comparing that. And, Again, I don't know how much this is really coming through on the webinar screen. The whole thing might look blurry for all I know if you're seeing it in a low resolution. But that little bit right about there is doing it for me. Right around 30% is giving me the slightly softer look that I want. All right now, I'm going to turn my other adjustments back on. One, two, three, four. And let's zoom back out. And now we've got what I would consider to be a reasonably accurate, filmy type look. Maybe I want to add a little bit more grain into this. Let's try that. Add a little film grain. Let's go into film type. And the grain is totally turned off right now. For those who haven't played with this before, this is the, it's kind of an opposite slider. It can be a little confusing if you've never played with it. But grain per pixel at its maximum setting is essentially no grain. Let me zoom into this. I'm actually going to zoom in like 200% to really make this clear. Let's go to a pretty flat part of the image. Um, yeah, so this should work. So kind of watch the road, watch the flat green areas. As I take the grain per pixel down, it gets grainier. And the reason for this is in the name, grain per pixel. At 500 per pixel, it is effectively no grain at all. As I bring this down, it's less grain per pixel, which means the grain is getting quote unquote bigger. I'm kind of doing air quotes here, it's getting bigger. And if you get to a point where it gets really, really grainy and chunky. Now, any, anyone who's seen me do these before knows that I always say that you should do your grain adjustments at 100% zoom. So zoom into 100%, take your grain, and now play with it until it gets that look that you want. And I'm just going to give it a little bit. I don't want to go crazy on this. It's not like some crazy high ISO film, but give it just a little bit of grain in there, and I think we're good to go. Let's zoom back out, and I like it. I like the way that image looks, so 
I'm going to I'm going to call it a day. Let's go ahead and apply this one. Save that. And we are good to go. All right. I'm going to jump over to the Q&A for a moment here because I see a couple coming in and let's see what we've got. Uh, all right. First question. Do you use color effects or Viveza before using analog effects? You most certainly can. So it always depends on what you're trying to achieve. There is no right or wrong when it comes to that of what you would want to do. I guess if you're thinking this from a purely practical point of how you should progress through, then I would say that the analog effects is probably the last thing you're going to do. But with that in mind, you might go into Analog Effects Pro and do something that you really love, but then go, you know, I, there's this part that's, um, I don't know, that's, a, that's blue that I really want to make more purple. It's just part of the image. You don't really have a tool like that in Analog Effects Pro. So you might need to take that into Color Effects Pro to do afterwards. Um, or you might be able to just do it inside of Photolab itself. In fact, I have a, the last image that I work on, I have a thing where we're going to kind of go back and forth a little bit and you'll see how, um, how I've plotted that out. But there are certainly things that you can do in Color Effects Pro that you can't do in Analog Effects Pro. So if you get into this tool and you make something and you're going, I love it, but I wish that I could change this, alter that, whatever, there's no reason not to go into Color Effects Pro afterwards or even to go back and forth, back and forth multiple times. You're working with a 16-bit TIFF file. You're, you have this really high bit depth TIFF file. It's not, you're, you're not going to be degrading the image by opening up into multiple apps, uh, multiple plugins. So um, yeah, so don't worry about it. Just go back and forth as much as you want. The one thing that you will lose if you are going back and forth is highlight and shadow detail if you are crushing and then re resurrecting highlights or shadows. So as an example, let's say that you've got um, a white wedding dress. Always an easy example. You've got a white wedding dress, perfectly exposed. It's white. You've got the detail in there. Great. You take it into analog effects and you, you come up with some look that you really dig, but it has kind of flattened out the detail in the dress. You've lost some of the detail in the dress. Okay. So you save that. And then you open it up in color effects and you go, oh, now I want to retrieve some of that detail. Probably gone. The detail is probably gone at that point. So you you do risk losing some details in the highlights and shadows when you're going back and forth. So it's just one of those things to be aware of. If you uh, can't protect the highlights the way that you want to in analog effects, then maybe you need to back up a step, go back into photo lab and give yourself a little more headroom, maybe pull the highlights down a little bit so that when you boost them the way that, you're, and that you want to boost them for a creative effect, that you're not losing the texture in there. Sometimes it takes them back and forth. And again, the last image that I'm going to show you today is exactly that process of getting into Analog Effects Pro and going, I should have done this, and then how to get back to where we were. Um, again, you'll see that in a little bit here. But uh, long answer to uh, what should have been a simple question, but there's no right or wrong way to do it. In general, I would do my corrective work before doing my creative work, which most likely means being in Color Effects Pro before being in Analog Effects. But Again, it just depends on what's going on. So hopefully that helps. Next question, can the defocus feature be done with a mask so only a small area is affected? The defocus does not have a mask. Um, pretty sure, let us let me just double, I'm gonna super double check that because quite sure it doesn't, but we're gonna make sure. Um, these unique names here, pretty sure it did not. Not, there's only some of the tools that have, um, have control points in, Analog effects, but let's let's just double check that. Um, let's see here. I'm just going to add the lens distortion. No, it does not. So yeah, you would see it underneath here. It would be those uh, control points, and it's not there. So unfortunately, not. If that's something that you really needed to do, um, yeah, you might be getting into compositing at that point. Um, unfortunately, you can do. I think you can do. Ooh, this is a good question. Let me cancel this. I think, do I have control point defocusing? I'm pretty sure I do. Um, yeah, I have a sharpness. Oh, it's even a blur. So I can do it. It's going to be a slightly different blur. It's not going to be the exact defocus blur, but I do have blurring in the local adjustments as a control point in Photolab. So if I knew that I wanted to make one area less focused than another, then I would do it here first. And then you can already see the differences in there and kind of how it handles it. I would do it here first uh, and then send that over. Yeah, that would be my approach. Cool. Good question. I like that question. Um, am I using a shortcut to zoom back out? So when you're in 
let's see here. Um, I don't know if you meant in Photolab or in the plugin. In Photolab, I'm just clicking on the button up here at the top to go from one to one and back out. In the plugins, I might've been hitting the space bar. I kind of do things very, I, uh, we'll check that next time we get in there. I don't remember how I did it. <laughs> One of those things, just kind of doing it so much that I, I forget how I did it. So I will come back to that. Um, all right. I think that's that. We look at my notes and um, yeah, let's move on to the next image. All right. No more questions. All right. We're good for now. Okay. Next photo is this one here. All right. This is taken in the Republic of Georgia. This is outside of Tbilisi, up uh, heading up towards Russia. And this is very foggy, misty, kind of canyony thing. It's got this great old world feel with this um, steeple or monastery or something up here that just looks awesome. You got this sunbeam coming through barely. I think the whole image looks really, really cool, but there's definitely some room to, to change on here, room to grow. So again, starting with the basic idea of what do I want? Well, I think in this one, because this is Everything here could be very old, right? The mountains, obviously, well, they've been around for probably a year or two. Um, these buildings here, these are quite old. These could have been around for you know 20 years or 100 years. Who knows? So this is definitely an image that could lend itself towards being made to look very, very vintage. So I'm going to play with uh, the wet plate looks on this particular photo. But before I get into the plugin, I do want to play with a few things. First of all, I want to straighten it. I, I, for some reason, I seem to have a problem standing up straight. Um, I'm going to use the straightening tool and i need to figure out so this is tough actually let's zoom into this um, this is going to be tough because where is the actual horizon line this wall appears to be slightly angled down um so i can't rely entirely on that where'd my other handle go there it is let's bring these in a little bit closer um i think this is going to be tough. I'm going to kind of guess it right about there. I'm looking at this building. Let's just apply that and see what happens. Looks pretty good. It might be a little bit too much. I'm going to drag that up just a little bit. Nope. Let's go the other way. Drag that down a little bit. There. I think that I'll buy that. Yeah, that looks straight. Okay. So that's one of those where I don't have a lot to go on. There's really not much to go on here. So it's a little bit of a guessing game, but that has straightened that out to what I think is now a straight image. So we're going to go for that. Okay. Next, this sunbeam here. I love this sunbeam, but I just it's just not there enough. I want to enhance this a little bit. So I came up with a kind of an interesting way to enhance this. Now, there's no you know right or wrong here. There's just different approaches. I thought I'd try something I've never done on one of these webinars before. And I'm going to use a local adjustment of a graduated filter. There's a linear gradient or I'm going to use part of the linear gradient to enhance this, and then I'm gonna erase the rest of it manually. If we look at this line here, you can see it's got a hard edge, I mean hard, hard-ish edge down the line here, and then it kind of blends out. So I'm going to draw a linear edge here, which now I have to reverse and go this way. There we go. And I'm going to, is that, no, sorry, I, I do want it the other way, let's do it like this. I'm going to put that heart edge. Is that what I want? Now I'm confusing myself here. I don't remember which edge I want to go. We're going to find out very quickly. I'm going to drop the mask, take the exposure, and bring it up. And yes, it is the other way that I wanted to go. Good job, genius. Let's flip that around. There we go. I'm going to utilize that edge there on the edge of the, the sunbeam. Now I've got to figure out where it was. Um, where were we? In fact, I'm going to take this down to zero again. Line this back up. Let's see here. Let's make sure it's rotated in angle with the sunbeam. There it is. Gonna get that edge line right there. Maybe make that a little bit of a less of a gradation, right about so. Okay, there. I think that's gonna be good. We'll find out. And I'm gonna take the exposure up on it. So yeah, this is totally gonna work. So we can see how this is getting brighter. Now all of this is getting brighter. This I'm gonna have to erase by hand. But for this part of it, I think this will work maybe i should add a little saturation into there probably doesn't matter i'm probably gonna get rid of it later anyway but let's just try it add a little bit of saturation in there maybe a little bit more brightness i think we're getting somewhere okay let me just close this and i want to toggle this on and off to see the differences so i'm going to go to my local adjustments and again ignore the top part i know we still have to fix that but just look at the beam in there 
And I feel like, yeah, that beam is standing out more and I think it's believable. I think we're gonna get away with this. So let's go back into the adjustment tool. With this one still selected, uh, with this one selected, I'm going to right click on here and grab the eraser. Now this is going to erase this existing mask just to kind of drive this point home. Let me make this smaller and defeather it. And I'm just gonna draw a line through here. And you can see that it has just erased that mask, right? So we see the effect that that is, that is just applied. Okay, obviously I wanna undo that. So undo that, Command Z, Control Z that. Now let's do a quite a large and very feathered adjustment. And probably right about here, I'm just going to kind of drag, manually drag this down and clean up that edge in there. So that's, we're getting there. It's a little bit too much. Yep, that's definitely too much. I'm gonna undo that. I'm gonna go for an even softer feather, make this even bigger. And I'm just gonna kind of start eating away at it. Let's just do this. Let's go back and forth on there to slowly eat away at that line. And this is a really good approach for doing subtle manual adjustments. Get a big soft brush. And again, all I'm looking at is this center area here. That's what I'm focusing on. So this big soft brush, drag that down, and I'm trying to make that beam look believable. Okay, I can get rid of all of this up here. Let's erase all of this. And the beam is hitting the edge of the hill there, so it's not hitting here, so I need to get rid of that. So for that, I'm going to take my feathering down a bit, and let's get rid of the mask up to here. There we go. I think that's believable. We don't need the mask up here, so we're gonna, del oops, we're gonna delete that as well. Just erase that out. Again, looking at the top edge of the mountains there. And perhaps another, let's take one more hit on this big soft edge here and just kind of approach the top of the beam. So I'm looking at the beam right there. I just want to kind of gradually pump that in. All right, let's see, how's that look? Is that believable? Let's close that. Oops, looks like I need to get rid of some more over here. Let's get rid of the rest of that. Feathering down, size down. Get rid of all this. I'm not quite sure where that came from. I thought I erased all that. Let's make sure that's gone. There we go. That's gone now. Close that. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it could be a little better. I could probably do a little bit more, but I that's pretty cool. Let me turn this on and off. See what I've done there? Yeah, I just kind of pumped up that beam in there. I dig it. I like it. I'm going for it. I'm sticking with it. This is what I'm going to use. All right. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else I want to do to this adjustment? Let me check my notes. Uh, nope, that's it. Let's take this now into. Analog Effects Pro and see what we can do to it. So again, my approach here is gonna be the wet plate look. We're gonna go for something very, very ancient looking. Ancient as far as photography goes, of course. And, um, oh, that's kind of cool. Okay, maybe it's a little overdone. Did I overdo it? Maybe I overdid it. Maybe we'll wanna go back and correct that. But I mean, that does look kind of cool, doesn't it? It's kind of cool. I probably could have left some of the beam in here in retrospect. Eh, oh, well, too late now. It's kind of cool. But I said I wanted to go for wet plate. So where are we? Wet plate look. And let's just play with some of these. I'm just gonna run through all the presets here and see what we've got to start with. Okay, it's a little bit too wet. Find one that's a bit more um, bit more usable, a bit more believable, a bit more, okay, that's a little bit too soft. Um, lots of different looks in here. Definitely some cool stuff to play with. To play with. That's kind of neat. That's kind of neat. Just keep on clicking through different ones. Find something that I like as a starting point. And remember again, the whole objective here isn't to find something that I'm finished with, but to find something that's a starting point. Oh, oh, I kind of like that as a starting point. All right, I think we're getting somewhere. I'm I'm good with this. So we're off to a good start with this one. Uh, let's see, like the dirt, I'm not a big fan of the dirt, but I guess in this photo, it does kind of make sense. Let's maybe take a look at the dirt and scratches options and see what's in here. So a lot of different patterns. If I click on this, there's dust and lint, there's scratches, organic, eroded. Oh, eroded actually might be good. Let's try eroded. And then click on one of these different presets. So each one of these pieces here is effectively a mask file that is you know, like a black and white grayscale mask file that is adding this level of effect. And any one of these that gets added, I can reduce the intensity of that. Most of these things, they start at 100, that's just too much. But if you kind of drag this down a little bit, you can get something that's a bit more believable. Many of these have repositioning tools as well. So you can reposition the gunk on the image to get that where you want. So maybe I want to have a very top eroded image there, but let's kind of back that off a little bit, make it not quite so obvious, quite so blatant, and there we go. So you can play with the positioning, all these different looks in here, eroded, or let's see what's under organic. Organic is kind of like a, uh, almost like a stucco wall look on it, it's kind of interesting, or a bit of 
bit of water. Ooh, this one here, water damage. This looks pretty good. Let's go for the water damage one. Let's bring the intensity up on that. Water damage is pretty pretty believable. So that's one option. I'm going to actually go back to, uh, let's go to scratches, actually. Oh, yeah, this one. Let's do this. Take the intensity down because that's way too much. That's, uh, all right, we're getting into believable land in there. All right, let's go for the photo plate itself and see what we've got in here. So once again, different types of plates. You've got these streaked plates on here. You've got corroded plates. Let's, let's stick with the corroded theme on here. Go for a bit of corrosion. Yeah, a little bit. No, actually, I back that off a little bit. Be kind of good. Now I'm feeling like these scratches that I did earlier are a bit too much. So let's just go back to a little dust and lint. We'll just throw some, some random thing on here and back it way off and um, call that a day. And let's go back into the photo plate. And yeah, I mean, I'm kind of digging where this is going. Uh, funny thing is, this whole thing is just looking still a little bit too sharp. I mean, take a look at this building. Um, zoom, I'm clicking the zoom button here. If I hit the space bar, it also zooms in and out. So that's the other option for the person who had asked that question. Um, so now looking at this photo, this uh, part of the building here, again, it's just, it's too sharp, right? There's no way this would be that sharp. Very important detail to pay attention to. So let's look at my lens tool. Oh, I don't have it in there. So let's go back over to this, open the camera kit, add in lens distortion, get rid of the pin cushioning and pin and barrel distortion because that definitely would not be happening. Get rid of the chromatic shift. Um, oops, not negative 100, but zero. Let's get that to zero, there we go. And let's add a little bit of defocusing on there. Probably actually quite a bit of defocusing because this would not be anywhere near that sharp. So add a little bit of softness in there. There, it's getting there at a little bit. We, we might want to go pretty heavy on this. That's, there we go. Kind of getting there. I'm going to take some of that photo plate look and back that off a little bit more as well. And maybe too much. Now we're okay. Now we're getting somewhere. So there we go. I dig it. Space bar to zoom out. And yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool, right? So that's the kind of fun stuff that you can do playing around like that, trying different things and, um, and just building it up with an intention in mind, with a starting point in mind. In this case, that wet plate look. I might have overdone this a little bit on there, but I'm going to leave it for now. Cool. All right, let's apply this. And I'm going to jump back over to the Q's and A's because there are some questions showing up here. Um, bu -bu -bu um, oh, there is a link which I'm assuming by now has been dropped into the chat um, with a list of all the keyboard shortcuts. So if you're looking for keyboard shortcuts, follow me and click on that link. Um, also, by the way, because I didn't have my opening slides, I'll mention this now. If you um, if you want to make any purchases based off of today, if you head over to photojoseph.com slash DXO, and I believe that link will get dropped into the chat for you as well, then you will be able to make a purchase. And there's also a discount code that will be dropped into the chat so that you can get 15% off of your purchase. Cool, thanks. Okay, um, with the monastery, why not use the horizon tool on a vertical line rather than a horizontal? You know, that's a really good point. I probably should have done that. Here's what they're talking about. Let me go, who, where my mouse go? Let's go here and I will um, reset this. So we're resetting the, the, um, the straightening. What they're saying is if I drag this vertically and zoom in to one to one on here and pan over here, could I either down the center of the monastery line there or off the edge of the building? I'm going to go, I guess I'm going to go off the center there. That would be an approach as well. Apply that. You're right, I probably should have done it that way. So yeah, that line, this line can be used either vertically or horizontally. The software will figure out what you mean. And if you go somewhere in between, then it's gonna be super wonky and um, you're gonna end up with something like that. So uh, zoom out of that and close that. Uh, you're gonna end up with something completely unusable. So yeah, definitely don't go at an angle. I get a dramatic angle, unless I suppose your photo really is at that angle, but you can go horizontal or vertical on there. Great approach. Thank you for reminding me that I could do that. Will I show, will you show us, will I show you saving a set of adjustments you have done in the camera kit as a new preset? I will, that is actually part of the next image. Any guidance on how much to edit a photo before applying a filter versus doing it after? Great, okay, great question. This leads back to the earlier question about which filter to use first. Keep in mind that when you're in Photo Lab in the first place, before you send it off to anything, uh, any other filter, you're working with a raw image. So this is your best chance, your best opportunity for things like highlight and shadow detail recovery. So again, using that white wedding dress example, photograph a white wedding dress, it is, um, 
it's textured, it's got some level of detail to it, but it's white. And you know, the bride's in the sun and you've got this like blown out image. And you look at it on the screen and it's totally blown out. Well, if I take that blown out image on screen and I open that the, in PhotoLab and I open that into a plugin, I have effectively written that loss of data into the file. Now, there's some exceptions because you are opening it as a 16-bit TIFF, a lot of that detail will still be there, but it is going to be easier to recover the detail, assuming it exists, when you're in the raw file. So first, do your corrective work. Do your highlight recovery, your shadow recovery, pulling the, the highlights down, pulling the exposure down to make sure that that detail on the white wedding dress, the texture on the tree bark or whatever it is, is there before you send it off to the plugin. I like to make sure that what I'm sending off to any plugin has all the detail that I want. If I choose to get rid of it again down the road because I choose to blow out some highlight detail, that's fine but I'd rather have the choice once I'm in the plugin. So I tend to adjust my image a bit more, let's say on the flat side, where I'm ensuring that I have all my, my shadow detail, I have all my highlight detail before I move it into the TIFF file for the plugin. So that would be the, that'd be the approach that I recommend. Um, it's certainly best to do that there. And there are certain things that you can only do when it's raw, like white balance. You can do, you can make an image warmer or cooler, but true white balance correction, which is a non-destructive process, white balance correction is an interpretation of the raw data. It is a number, is nothing more. This is why when you shoot something in raw, if you shoot it at the wrong white balance, you can completely change that and fix it in the software. Um, that is something you can't do to a TIFF file. In a TIFF file, you can just make it warmer or cooler, but it's not true white balance. So true white balance only happens on the raw file. So that's the kind of adjustment you definitely want to do before you send it off to any plugin where it gets converted to a TIFF. Great question, thank you. Um, is there a tin type look? I don't think there. Uh, I didn't see a tin type in there. There might be. Oh, we'll, we'll, I'll try to remember to take a look when we're back in there again. Okay. Last image to work with. So this image, this next one here is this photo. Yeah, let's zoom out of this. Taken in Oaxaca, Mexico, this is a, uh, a beautiful sunrise, this kind of salt water, salt pool water thing. It's just, it's, I, love, I love it. Um, but I want to I wanna have some fun with this. And I do have a kind of a general idea where I want to go. I want to hold on to the warmth in the sky here, but I want to really emphasize the blue in the top of the sky here and the blue in the reflection in the water. And uh, other than that, I'm not totally sure where, where I want to take it, but I do know that's something I want to do. Now, I can do some basic work in here as always i could do some color work in here but i kind of know that i already am just going to leave it pretty much as it is um, i am going to check the horizon so let's just check that we'll use our horizon line tool drag that on there and realize that for once i was actually standing almost perfectly straight so i think we're good there nice easy horizon line good we'll apply that and i also know that there's a little bit of retouching i want to do because let's zoom in 100 percent um let's close out of the horizon tool there is a little bit of dirt on the sensor. We're, oh, did I? <laughs> I'm going to hit reset because I forgot to reset that. Um, there we go. There's the dirt on the sensor. So let's let's fix some of those. So I'm going to grab the healing brush tool and I'm just going to start clicking on some of these to get rid of them. I'm not going to go crazy on this. I'm not going to fix everything. But this was shot at a pretty wide aperture and um, uh, pretty small aperture, meaning that I'm, do have, I do have quite a few sensor spots showing up in here so i'm going to quickly go around and get rid of some of these not all of them I'm not going to go crazy here but i want to get rid of some of the big ugly obvious ones so quickly these aren't sensor spots that's just stuff on the water so you might decide that you do want to correct that um by the way when you're using the retouching tool you do have some great keyboard shortcuts in here that you can use i'm holding down the shift key right now and scrolling my mouse wheel back and forth and you can see the softness of that uh, that tool changing as well as the feathering slider down here changing. So I've got that. If I hold down the command key, and I think that's going to be control, or I'm not sure on Windows which one it is, but on, on the Mac, it's command key. That will change the size of this. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So I can get in there and just kind of quickly change the size of that tool to do whatever it is I need it to do. Um, anyway, I'm not going to get rid of all of them again. Just get rid of some of the really bad ones. And I think that's good enough. Okay. Close that. Now I did hit the reset button, which means I also need to fix my horizon line again. Um, so let's just grab that horizon line tool. Oops, drag that up into place. And I think that's probably good. Apply that. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, let's close that. Let's take this into 
Analog Vector Pro 2. We're gonna have some fun in here. Now, this is a case where some of the presets might be great. I mean, we'll click through them because why not? We're here. Um, you know, it's always, a, again, a good place to get inspiration, to get ideas. Just try out these different presets and see what you want. But I know what I want, and I know that what I want is not in any of these. Someone asked about tin type. Um, maybe under vintage, is there anything called tin type? There's not. I, I recall, I'm pretty sure there's some tin type specific tools in Silver FX Pro, um, which makes sense because tin type would be something that would not be in color. So that would probably be a good place to look for a tin type effect. Okay, um, I'm gonna go for the camera kit. I am going to start from scratch. So I'm gonna get rid of all of these existing tools. The way that you get rid of them, just like adding one, you click on the plus. To get rid of it, you hit the little minus button here. Now something has to be here. There has to be some adjustment on there. So I'll leave the basic adjustment intact. So that's in place. Um, I'm also going to reset that so that we are back to our default. So now if I hit the compare button, we have made no changes to this whatsoever. I can replace the basic adjustment, but I happen to know I'm gonna need it later, so I'll just leave that in place, and let's add another tool. Um, I'm going to go straight to the film types. Click on the plus, that adds the film type stack to here. And as I said, I know that I wanna go with kind of a bluish look, so that's gonna be a cool look. I'm gonna choose the cool presets under film type, and then just start clicking through these, and you'll see we got some kind of purpley, some kind of greenishy, and then these kind of bluey ones. And the bluey ones are the way, or the way that I want to go. So I'm gonna go for this last one here, which has got a little bit too much grain in it. Let's just get rid of the grain entirely for now. Might bring some of that back later. But we'll get rid of that grain by taking the grain per pixel all the way up. Then there's this strength slider for the overall adjustment. If I take this all the way down, then we have effectively removed this adjustment. If I do a comparison now, there is nothing to compare to. We're back to where we started. If I take the strength up to 100, then we're doing 100% application of this color overlay. It's not quite right there, so I'm going to back it off a little bit, but I'll find a place in there that makes me happy, which is probably right around there. I like that coolness to it. Now I've lost some of the some of this punch that I had in the uh, in the sun here, so I want to add some saturation to that. Now if I go back to basic adjustments, I do have a saturation slider for the whole image, but this is not what I want. I don't want saturation over the whole thing. I just want it over the sun, the bright sunny area area there. So for here, we do have control points. I'm leaving the global adjustments, which is what these sliders are. I'm leaving them all at their 0% positions. And then I'm gonna add a control point onto the sunny spot here. Let's turn on the mask so I can see exactly what I'm affecting. And let's make that maybe a little bit bigger. I can drag it up a little bit more. I can position the control point so I'm affecting the area that I want. And then in the control point adjustments, you'll see that there is a saturation slider here. So let's take that and pump it up a little bit and let's get some of that warm glow back in. And I can, now that that's applied, I can reposition this and see what the difference would be depending on where I wanna put it. And um, we're gonna go right about there. So now I've got that extra pump of the, um, of the orange in there. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Um, there's, in my mind, there is a bit of a risk with this photo because this is such a subtle gradient with no clouds in the sky. There is a risk for banding on this. We're not seeing any banding now because I'm working with a 16-bit TIFF, I'm not seeing any banding. But when I export this out as an 8-bit JPEG to put on Instagram or whatever, odds are this is going to band. And so knowing that, I'm gonna break this up a little bit with a little bit of grain. Not much, just enough to break it up. So let's go into 100%, go back to my film type. And again, grain per pixel starts at 500, meaning there's virtually none. And as I bring that down, I will add that grain in. Now, I don't want much. I'm not trying to make it look like a grainy photo. I just want enough where it will break up any potential banding. So right about there, should do it. That should be enough. And of course, once you do this and you export out your JPEG, if you find that you are getting banding in it, then come back in and add a little bit more grain to that to really break that up just a little bit more. But I think that this should do it right there. Okay, so here I'm happy, right? I like this image. But now I'm looking at it going, you know, I really wish that this was cooler down here, that I had a bit more of the blue enhancement down here on the bottom part of the image. How am I gonna do that? Well. Regular viewers will know that one of my favorite ways to cool or blue out a part of an image is to use the white balance controls. But as I was explaining just a little bit ago, we can't do white balance to the image once we have uh, rendered it out as a TIFF file because it's no longer raw. So if I click save right now, I'm going to have this as a TIFF, but then the white balance tools will not be available to me inside of PhotoLab. So what I really need to do is go back to the raw file and enhance the white balance for this part of the image here 
before I take it into Analog FX Pro. Okay, well, that's easy enough. So I want to just jump out of here. I'm going to cancel this, make the changes, and bring it back in again. But I just did custom work, right? I added a film type. I got it dialed in. I got my green. I got my saturation. I don't want to lose all that. And I even did a adjustment to a control point. So what I want to do right now is save this as a preset, but I want to save it as a preset with the control point. So if I go over here to custom and I just click the plus, I'm going to call this, uh, let's call this Oaxaca blue. What I've just created is a preset that is this, but it does not have the control point. If I apply this to another image, that control point will be gone. If I want to save the control point, here's a little hidden thing inside of PhotoLab, or inside of um, the plugins. There's no UI that tells you this. You just have to know this. But if I hold down the shift key and click on the plus, now it's going to create a preset that holds onto the control point. So I'm going to call this one Oaxaca with the shift. So you know that this is the one where I held down the shift key. Let's actually spell Oaxaca correctly and click OK. All right, so now I've got two different presets, one with and one without the control point. I'm going to cancel this because I don't want this image right now. I'm going to go back to my raw photo. I'm going to go into local adjustments, control click on here to add a control point. We're going to drop the control point down into the corner here. And I'm going to go to the color adjustments and I'm going to cool the temperature by making it blue or I'm going to blue it by making the color temperature cooler. So now I've just added a little bit more blue into that there. I toggle this on and off. You can see it's subtle. But that little extra blue there is going to give me what I want. So now I'll go ahead back into the Knit Collection, back into Analog FX Pro. It's going to ask if I want to overwrite the previous TIFF. Or well, remember, I didn't do anything to it. So I'm going to say go ahead and overwrite that TIFF file. Of course, if you're unsure, then just make a new one. And, um, and then you can you know, double check it later before you delete it. And now in here, let's go in and uh, I'm going to, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to do this just to kind of prove the point. Let's get rid of all these other tools. Let's make sure that we are totally at our default position. Reset this. Okay, everything is reset. Compare, we see nothing on here. Let me go to custom. I'm going to start by adding the original Oaxaca blue. I add that in, but look, there's nothing under the control points. So now I'll add my one where I held down the shift key and boom, our control point is there. So I've got that control point back. So this allows me to pick up exactly where I left off, even with the control points. By holding down the shift key, when you click on that plus button, saving that as a custom preset. This preset no longer will really apply to any other image, but it is a perfect way to get back where I started. And now I can click save and look look at that cool blueness in the corner there. Digging that, that's the look that I wanted. Click on save and away we go. All righty, so that is everything that I wanted to show you. We've got a few more minutes for a few more questions and let me pull these up and see. Is it possible to batch export multiple image with the same vintage presets? Not here. No, you'd have to, to do batch processing with the presets. You actually need to use Photoshop for that and build an action. Um, pretty sure I'm going to I'm going to go at 90 percent confidence on this answer that there's no way to do batch processing of these without using Photoshop. Um, Lori, if you're if I'm wrong, tell me in the, my, our little chat and I will I will correct myself. Can the actual beam be hidden and replaced with a beam? that hits the building, Oof, why not just brush on the beam? Okay, so two questions there. Um, could that one be hidden? To hide the beam that was there, you would have to, uh, you'd have to drop the exposure so that it matched the background around it. That'd be pretty hard, not saying it couldn't be done, but that would be a pretty good challenge. Uh, to add a beam to the building, absolutely, do the same thing that I just did, but you're, instead of enhancing an existing one, you're just kind of adding one that isn't there. Why didn't I use the brush tool? because it's hard to get a really perfect straight line with the brush, right? You get to be really smooth and I don't have a tablet here. The tablet would be a bit easier, but I felt like for this, using that linear gradient, I would get half of what I needed perfectly to begin with, a perfectly straight edge, a nice even fall off, and then I could manually erase the back of it. Um, you could try with the brush stroke for sure. And if you can get a nice straight one, then great power to you. Um, I just felt like this was a better approach for what I was doing. Is there a way to turn an effect upside down or by 90 degree in, in increments? Um, it depends on the effect. So inside of Analog FX Pro, some of the effects like the, uh, the film plate thing that was added, there was a tool that I could kind of reposition it. Some of those you can scale, you can rotate. It just depends on the effect. So it's certainly not everything, but some of the ones where you can move it around, you can actually do rotation in there. Very high level question. Why do photographers want to emulate old film types when what we have now is so much better? Ah, better. Why is old wine better than new wine? 
Sometimes things, it's not about better. It's just about preference. For example, for me personally, I've been a photographer forever. I started my, my career in photography on film. I have a, a perhaps a nostalgic love of film. So that maybe that's part of it. For me, straight digital photos feel too clean. They're too, too digital. They're just too clean, too crisp. I like film. I like photos that have a little bit of an organic feel to them, a little bit of a natural feel to them. So what I will do in my personal photography, and you'll see this if you look at my Instagram or anything else, um, you'll see that I almost always add, and, and may not be able to tell that it's been added, but I almost always add a little bit of grain because I like the way it breaks up the digital sharpness to it. I call it soul. It's a very pretentious thing to call it, but I call it soul, adding a little bit of soul back into the image. I like it. It just, it works for me. It speaks to me. It's not right or wrong. It's just what I like and what I prefer. So um, to the answer to the question of why, because we like it. Why do some people like tomato soup and others don't? It's just, it's just a preference. It's just what you like or don't like. Um, given that that's what the topic today was the vintage effects. Clearly we're going to add a lot of vintage looking stuff to it, but, um, but there you go. That's, that's why. Uh, you know, I think a lot of this was made, was brought back to the forefront with the Instagram filter. Back when Instagram launched, it was all these ridiculous filters that, you know, you could take a really terrible photo of your shoe and uh, put a filter on it. And suddenly it was art. And I say that because my very first Instagram photo post was exactly that. Um, I was like one of the first, you know, uh, first couple thousand or 10,000 members on Instagram, like very, very early. And my first photo is still there. It's awful. Go to the beginning of the feed. It's terrible. Right. But then, you know, that's what it was. Like, oh, look, I'm in an air, literally, as an air airport, took a picture of my feet, added a filter. I was like, oh, that's cool. It's not cool, but whatever. It is what it is. And it brought that whole idea of these vintagey looks back to the forefront. And um, and we've really, and it, it, now we're really kind of jumping on that. And it's, it's just a lot of fun to play with. But now you have a lot more control than just a one off filter. Um, and to that effect, Analog Effects Pro has been around long before Instagram. Long before Instagram, just saying. Okay. Um, that's that. Uh, confirmation, don't think we can do any batch processing from analog effects yet. So again, I'm, to reassure that, I'm pretty sure that you just have to use Photoshop, uh, the um, um, actions to do a batch processing. I know that I have done a show on that, been a few years, but if you go to photojoseph.com slash DXO, scroll down towards the bottom of the page is a list of all the webinars that I've done. They're all there. Look at all of those and you will find uh, one in there about batch processing, and I'd watch that if if you want to know how to batch. That's that's pretty sure that's covered there. Okay, I guess that's that. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in today. I think yeah, registration is already open for the next batch for next month. So that's at the top of the page at photojustcom dxo And I guess that's it. It's time for lunch. Take care, everybody. See you next time.